Lucy Janjigian, an Armenian artist, has created a series of paintings called Uprooted. The paintings depict the plight of the Armenian people who were victims of genocide by the Turks. Many of those that survived were uprooted and forced to flee their homeland. Armenia, with a population of 3 million, is a land composed of mountainous terrain totaling 11,500 square miles. The total population of Armenia worldwide is 6 million, with 3 million in the diaspora. Armenia is located in the southwestern Caucasus, bordering Azerbaijan, Georgia, Iran, and Turkey. Therefore, it is an island of Christianity in an ocean of mostly Islam. The exception is neighboring Georgia, whose population is over 83% Christian and about 11% Muslim. In 301 AD, Armenia was the first nation in the world to adopt Christianity as a state religion. The Zoroastrian King Turtat proclaimed it so after his conversion to Christianity because of his miraculous cure through the diligent prayers of St. Gregory, the Illuminator. In 2001, Armenians celebrated the 1,700th anniversary of Christianity as their nation's state religion. In 405, an Armenian alphabet was developed by Mesrop Mashtots for the specific purpose of translating the Bible from the original Greek into Armenian. Beautifully illustrated Armenian illuminated manuscripts ensued. In 451 AD, even though the Battle of Avarair, led by General Vartan Mamigonian, was lost against the Zoroastrian Persians, it is considered a victory. They fought bravely and courageously defended Armenia's Christianity and cultural identity. Despite the Armenians' defeat, the Persians moved out and Armenia continued to be a Christian nation. This battle is memorialized and St. Vartan's Day is commemorated in February every year. In 1064 AD, the Seljuk Turks invaded Armenia and forced many Armenians to leave their homeland. By 1514, the Ottoman Turks had gained control of Armenia and remained until their defeat in World War I. In 1894, the Turks began a campaign of genocide against the Armenians. Between 1915 and 1918, the Turks killed over one and a half million people and drove tens of thousands from their homeland. From 1920 till 1990, Armenia was under communist rule. It was one of more than a dozen republics of the former USSR. On September 21, 1991, Armenia became a fully independent republic. The 1915 Armenian massacre by the Turks was the first genocide of the 20th century and was to become the blueprint for the Nazi Holocaust under Hitler's Germany. On August 22, 1939, when Hitler ordered his death units to exterminate without mercy, he said, after all, who remembers the Armenians? This Turkish atrocity took place during World War I, when Turkey, an ally of Germany, undertook this ignominious act. Britain and France were too involved in the war to pay attention to reports by their envoys and missionaries. America ignored Ambassador Henry Morgenthau's detailed accounts of the carnage. The young Turk government took advantage of the situation and planned and executed this genocide against the Armenian people. To this day, Turkey denies that the genocide occurred. 
despite overwhelming evidence. The massacres began on April 24, 1915 in Constantinople, when 250 Armenian leaders, professors, and clergy were rounded up and killed. Thousands of poor Armenians were murdered in the streets or deported on death marches into the desert. According to the Armenian National Institute 2006, this genocide has been recognized by the Association of International Genocide Scholars, Council of Europe, International Court of Transitional Justice, the European Parliament, and the World Council of Churches. Also by the following countries, Argentina, Canada, Cyprus, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Lebanon, Russia, Uruguay, Sweden, Switzerland, Vatican City, and several other countries, as well as 39 states of the 50 United States of America. The notable and sad exceptions are the United States and the United Kingdom. On April 24, 2005, Armenians commemorated the 90th anniversary of the 1915 Armenian Genocide by the Turks. On April 24, 1915, the Ottoman Empire began a program of a planned, systemic extermination of a people. It began the torture, removal, and murder of the Armenians from what has been their homeland for over 3,000 years. And it is my honor to be here to speak at the commemoration, the 90th anniversary commemoration of the Armenian Genocide. On a spring morning in April 1915, Armenians all through Turkey were being rounded up and deported to an unknown place. Supposedly, these deportations were for the Armenian safety, so that no Armenian casualties would occur during the First World War. These deportations occurred inconspicuously at first, with only the Armenian leaders being deported. Then came the Armenian soldiers, followed by the entire population of Armenians. Only the Armenians in hiding and the ones who assisted the Turks would be able to live. There are thousands of us Armenians in New York City. We just left Times Square and we are at the footsteps of St. Patrick's Cathedral where there will be a service to remember those one and a half million that were killed by the Turks in 1915. The Turkish government does not acknowledge that this ever happened and the American government has not yet acknowledged it either. We are here so that people will know that this did happen and there are many other genocides that take place in this world. As an Armenian artist, Lucy Janjigian has 32 paintings dealing with genocide. The first paintings deal with the Armenian genocide. They were begun when the 70th anniversary was commemorated in 1985. Lucy made it into a universal genocide theme of the uprooted. Because of man's inhumanity to man, many nations have suffered. Lucy Janjigian's sensitivity regarding the plight of uprooted people is a manifestation of her ethnic background and the experiences of those close to her. Over the years, the artist has heard many personal accounts of these massacres and their impact. She has attempted to capture these feelings and moods and to express them in her art. ghost light figures portrayed in vivid colors on large canvases enable the viewer to ponder human suffering.
Painting One, Flames of Faith. A group is escaping by night as an Armenian church is in flames. It is set on fire by the Turks. Those who sought refuge in the church perished, as did all historical and personal documents. Painting two, Fading Footsteps. This painting reminds us of the Israelites' exodus in the wilderness. Armenian women, children, and the aged are driven out of their homes to march in the harsh Syrian desert with no provisions of food or drink. They trusted in Job 13, 15, which reads, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Their faith gave them courage to endure exhaustion, starvation, and rape. Murder took the lives of thousands. Traces of their marches vanished in the sands. Painting 3, Desert March. Deported refugees trek in the merciless desert. They were told that they were being relocated. That was a lie as they were banished from their homes where they had lived for centuries. Painting 4, Journey. Under a barren tree, a desperate family contemplating their fate in a deserted landscape. Painting 5, a drop of water. The late Hagop Yakubian, born in a suburb of Harpert, in his poem, A Drop of Water, recalls his mother's demise. Standing in the desert, she is staring at the broken water jug while clutching her baby and holding onto her eldest son. These are the words she utters as she breathes her last, Gatil Mechur, Gatil Mechur. A drop of water, a drop of water. An older woman covers her face as she contemplates the outcome. Painting six, River of No Return. A young woman wishing she was carved out of rock. In his poem, The Crane, Hovan Nestumanian writes, but I'm exiled from my ruined nest and roam with faltering steps from hill to hill. And to the birds of heaven in my unrest, envying the boulders motionless and still. His Eminence Archbishop Torkom Manugyan, the former primate of the Armenian Apostolic Church in New York City, when he saw this painting, recalled the exiled young women during their desert march, who contemplated suicide in the river Euphrates rather than being subjected to rape, torture, or death. A viewer wished her mother could have seen the blue waters of the river, as she always spoke of the river running red with blood. Another woman took her two teenage daughters to the river three times before she mustered the courage to drown them sparing them the agonies that lay ahead. Painting seven, a little child shall lead them. Isaiah 11, six. Armenians escaping from their steep mountain villages on foot. A little child is leading them past the church in the valley. Painting eight, dispersion. Armenians fleeing their homeland in the dark of night. The barren tree is symbolic of their plight. The light in the horizon towards which they are escaping affirms their hope. As in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Painting 9. Mirage. The poet Huvan Nestumanian expresses it best in his poem, The Crane. Ah, whither leads this pathway long and dark? My God, 
where ends it? Thus with fears obsessed? Where shall night end this day's last glimmering spark? Where shall my weary feet tonight find rest? The following four paintings portray scenes from stories she heard her father tell and from Franz Werfel's book entitled The Forty Days of Musadagh. News of the atrocities that had taken place in eastern Turkey, Diyarbakir, Erzurum, Kharpert, Mush, Van, and many other towns and villages reached the region of Cilicia near the Syrian-Turkish border. After hearing the news of the Armenian massacre, the cluster of villages, Bityas, Haji Hababli, Yonoluk, Khderbek, Vakaf, Ezir, and Kabusiye chose to resist. They determined to run to the mountains and fight the Turks, rather than surrender to be burnt alive, raped, robbed, and forced on death marches. My father, Harutun Boyajian, and my maternal uncles, Boros and Sarkis Karakashian, along with 5,000 of the villagers, took refuge on Musada, the mountain of Moses. Painting 10, Escape 1. This exodus was planned in order to save Armenian lives and honor, and for their heritage and Christian faith to survive. Cleric and civil leaders organized the 5,000 inhabitants of seven villages to take refuge in the densely forested and steep mountain of Moses on the fringe of the Mediterranean Sea. Women, children, and old men, together with their livestock, carried their meager supplies as they climbed the rugged mountain to avoid being murdered. Dogs and roosters were not taken as their noises would give away the campsites. Painting 11, Escape 2. Women, children, and the aged climbed as a flock of sheep herded by their shepherd. Men between the ages of 18 to 45 years old had been enlisted in the labor corps of the Sultan's army. They dug trenches. After completion of their tasks, they were killed and buried in mass graves that they themselves had dug. Painting 12, Deliverance. After 40 days during Sunday Mass on September the 5th, 1915, as they sang, Dear Varhormia, Lord have mercy on us, a scout on the lookout excitedly shouted, A ship, a ship! Providence would be their deliverance. Their food supplies were running low and cold weather was rapidly approaching. Had this rescue not arrived, the desperate leaders had planned a mass suicide similar to the Jews at Masada. One of the officers of the French battleship, Le Gouchen, who came to the rescue, was of Armenian descent, Charles Diran Takayan. He was helpful in organizing the evacuation. He telegrammed for five more battleships to come and helped with the transport of the 5,000. Painting 13, Salvation Valley. Living in fear of Turkish wrath under harsh conditions, the uprooted descend en masse from their hideouts to be ferried by boats to the six French ships. They were transported to the tented refugee Lazaret camp on the banks of the Suez Canal in Port Said, Egypt. Painting 14, The Cliff. The ominous red sky conveys the urgency of the catastrophe. An 84-year-old man, with tears in his eyes, recalled his village of Chengush, a suburb of Karpert. All the villagers were forced to climb up the cliff and were left stranded there. They all perished. As a young boy, he was able to escape from between the soldiers' legs. Painting 15, Desolation. Their trials yet not over. Having reached the valley, a challenging mountain looms before them. A new path lies before us, 
We know not where it leads, but God go on before us, providing all our needs. This path so new, so different, exciting us we climb, will lead us in his perfect light until the end of time. The following three paintings tell the story of the artist's mother as a hidden child, a term coined by Eli Weissel during the Holocaust, referring to the hidden Jewish children by the righteous Gentiles. Painting 16, Hidden Child. Orphaned as a young girl, my mother, Sima Karakashian, was hidden with Rifat Agha's wealthy family in Urfa, Turkey. They were Muslim Arabs with Turkish citizenship. They changed her name to Nariman. After several years, her older sister Zaruhi, who was staying with Franciscan nuns, brought her to the convent in Lebanon. There she was given another new name, Mary, which was the one she went by for the rest of her life. Painting 17. Interim security. This painting shows Nariman within the security of the womb. Then, as an older girl, she is facing outwards, ready to leave. Painting 18, Dreaming of Freedom. My mother, now known as Mary, behind bars wishing she had freedom, symbolized by the doves flying freely above her, giving her the message of hope. My mother and aunt joined their two brothers who were in Jerusalem, Palestine, where they had attended St. George's, an Anglican mission boys' school modeled on British public schools. Haruchun Boyajian, a classmate of Mary's twin brother, Boros, fell in love with Mary. There they married in September 1930. I was their firstborn in Jerusalem, their new home. Painting 19. Exhausted, apparition-like refugees arrive at the ancient Arab Muslim cities that offered them refuge, Aleppo, Damascus, and Jerusalem. Painting 20. War and Peace. In 1948, when Palestine was partitioned and war broke out between Palestinians and Israelis, my family left war-torn Jerusalem and moved to Amman, to the then primitive but peaceful land east of the River Jordan. Painting 21, Barbed Children. Expressions of despair on Palestinian children's faces as they are caught in the midst of turmoil and behind barbed wire barricades. Painting 22, Family. A despairing Palestinian family, unable to escape. Beginning with painting number 23, we see that man's inhumanity towards one another is a universal plight. Painting 23, The Remnant. Father and son are exiled in a bleak, snow-covered landscape. Refugees are trudging in the distance. Painting 24, Voyage of Despair. Immigrants tossed in the high seas without provisions are at the mercy of the raging waters. Painting 25, The Uprooted. Vietnamese boat people fleeing their country towards an unknown future. Painting 26, Images. African refugees forced to abandon their land, fleeing with dignity. Painting 27, Broken Spirit. 
an extinguished oil lamp, a woman yearning for compassion. Painting 28, Refugees. In Afghanistan, war has forced the people into exile. Painting 29, Exiled. Afghans fleeing their beautiful mountainous country. Painting 30, Ravages of War. Bombs explode, fires break out, causing the upheaval of people, devastation and death, affirming man's inhumanity to man. The next painting was done for the 200th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty. Painting 31, The Landing. Uprooted from unstable war-torn countries, refugees have sought a new beginning in America. They have landed with few possessions, heeding the call of the statue. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. Painting 32, Expulsion. In Genesis, we read of Adam and Eve as the first to be uprooted from paradise, the Garden of Eden. As an uprooted Armenian, Lucy would like to conclude with William Soroyan's words that reveal his faith in his nation. I should like to see any power in the world destroy this race, this small tribe of unimportant people whose history is ended, whose wars have been fought and lost, whose prayers are no longer answered. There's a war in the world. Destroy Armenia. See if you can do it. Send them from their homes into the desert. Let them have neither bread nor water. Burn their houses and their churches. See if they do not live again. See if they will not laugh again. For when two of them meet anywhere in the world, see if they will not create a new Armenia. <laughs>